The MLB offseason is here, and we are speaking with a baseball legend who recently became a part owner. We're also examining the forces that could shape this offseason, and we have stories from the NBA, WNBA, and Unrivaled. It's Friday, November 1st. I'm your host, Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're talking about the World Series, team building, and becoming a part owner of the Orioles with MLB legend Cal Ripken. My colleague Eric Fisher joins to discuss the MLB offseason. We're also looking at an NBA rivalry that may be a pure media creation. And trivia question, Magic Johnson is a part owner of the Dodgers and other teams. With LA's World Series win, how many championships does he have between his time as a player and an owner? You'll hear the answer a little later. First, hear your top headlines. World Series Game 4 averaged a whopping 16.7 million viewers across all Fox platforms. That total nearly doubles last year's Game 4 audience, coming in at 92% higher. That's the most watched game of this year's Fall Classic so far, helps if the game wasn't competing with the sports equinox, and it's the most watched baseball game of any kind since Game 7 of the 2017 World Series. Speaking of Game 4, you may not have heard of Dodgers Game 4 starting pitcher Ben Kasparius before, but he is a World Series champion nonetheless, and his girlfriend has a few championships of her own. Kasparius, who wasn't called up to the Dodgers postseason roster until midway through the NLDS, dates UNC field hockey coach and five-time field hockey national champion Aaron Matson. With a World Series and five NCAA championships under their belt, Matson and Kasparius are a certified power couple in the big leagues. Paul Skeens and Livy Dunn need to keep their heads on a swivel. Alex Kirilov of the Minnesota Twins unexpectedly decided to call it a career at the age of 26. A once highly touted prospect, Kirilov had trouble staying healthy throughout his time as a baseball player and said in his retirement announcement that he is no longer up for the physical demands of the sport. A 72-year-old is also calling it a day. Bob Costas said that he is retiring from doing play-by-play on MLB games following his much-criticized performance for TBS in the most recent playoffs. The Hall of Fame broadcaster said that he made the decision before the season began that this year will be his last. He will still contribute to MLB Network as an analyst. Unrivaled has been building hype for their final unclaimed roster spots, announcing Lexi Hull on Wednesday as the 29th of 30 players. Then on Thursday, league co-founder Nafisa Collier announced that Unrivaled will add one roster spot to each of its six teams for a 36-player league. Collier said that the league beat its initial financial projections, allowing them to expand. Up next, Cal Ripken is an MLB Hall of Famer, and now he is a part owner of the Baltimore Orioles, the only team he played for, after he joined the new ownership group led by David Rubenstein. We spoke about the World Series, the offseason, how this new ownership group will approach the team, and whether Clutch is real. It's great to chat with him, and that conversation is coming up next. Welcome, Cal. Oh, thank you very much. Great to have you on. So uh, we just saw the end of the World Series. I just w- would love to get your thoughts on on that series. How how do you enjoy it? It's uh, you know, um, my expectation was it was going to go a little longer than uh, yeah the five games. Um, I think from a business decision, I think everybody uh, would have liked to seen it gone into the, the six games yeah. or seven games. But it really strikes me is that the playoffs is a new season. You know, uh, yeah. you can prove that you're the best team over 162. You have the best depth and you play most consistently and you uh, you, you play well. But when you get into a, a playoffs, it's a whole new season. And it's not who really necessarily wants it the best. It's who plays the best. And clearly the Dodgers executed on a little bit higher level. Um, they did the little things that drove in runs. The Yankees uh, kind of imploded in that one inning yesterday yeah. where all the little things turned out to erase that uh, 5 to nothing lead that they built. It seemed like they were going to uh, force it to game six and then it was going to get really interesting. But uh, all those mistakes in that inning, um, the Dodgers capitalized on it and came back and win. So to me, it's, you know, we look at the analytics and we look at uh, the home runs and sit back and wait to, to, to make a big swing and score the runs. But it's still about the little things. It's still about getting that runner in from third base, you know, uh, putting the ball in play and not striking out, you know, to give yourself a chance. Um, base running uh, is really important. Defense is really important. And so it seemed like the Dodgers, um, they out-executed uh, uh, the Yankees in this series. Two really great teams, and uh, it had the potential to be this, you know, seven-game, uh, you know, dramatic series. But uh, the Dodgers got on a roll and uh, they couldn't stop them. Yeah, it, that, that was a just a bizarre game. I mean, you know, Yankees go up 5-0, and I'm like, okay, it looks like we're going back to L.A., and then they had that inning where it was like two or three plays where I was like, 
I think I would have made that catch. <laughs> like, you know, it's well, uh, I mean, it, it does happen. I mean, uh, very rarely. I mean, to see Judge uh, miss the ball, he yeah. just seemed to take his eye off of it a little bit and look to the, uh, the runner on first base. I'm not sure, so sure if he was thinking, do I have a chance to, uh, you know, double him mm-hmm. off or something? I'm not sure. But that comes off of him making a great catch off of Freeman, jumping right. up against the wall and catching the ball and coming down. He's a fantastic uh, all around player. And yeah. So it's just one of maybe a, a lapse of concentration on that little play. And then to make matters worse, the uh, ground ball uh, in the hole, trying yeah. to get a force out at third base. Um, might not have been the best decision to go at third yeah. base. Maybe you get a force out. You got a five run lead at that time. You're really looking for an out, not yeah. looking for a double play. Uh, but that decision and then and then Cole not covering first base. Yeah. You know, wow. Uh, all three of those things happening right on top of each other. And the funny part about it was Cole being so good, almost pitched himself out of that jam. You know, yeah, two strikeouts right. uh, and he would have got out of it um, if he would have just covered first base. So uh, yeah. um, it's the game of baseball. You, you, you always say, um, you know, I've seen everything, you know, in the mm-hmm. game in some ways when you play it for a long, long time. But sure. the truth of the matter is you haven't seen everything. And um, I haven't seen an inning like that come together. Yeah. Um, and cause a downfall like it did last night. Yeah, I certainly have not either. Um, and yeah, with that game, Juan Soto is now a free agent. Um, he's, for, I guess I'll, I'll ask you how how many hundreds of millions. He's going to start with a five or a six. I guess we'll start there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it is interesting. Um, um, when I was playing baseball, the older guys in baseball were kind of wishing that they played in my era. You know, because sure. all of a sudden you started to get paid and you started to get to make money and um, in the era before that, they had to have take jobs in the off season, you know, just to, 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 to keep the money thing right or go to winter ball and kind of um, play down there to make a little bit, a little bit of money. And now uh, when I look at it, I'm going, man, it'd been nice to play in this era. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, the numbers, sometimes it's uh, I always thought they were kind of, kind of hard to understand anyway. It's, it's the business, it's the value that's uh, there. But I think when you get down to it, um, that's the business side. You strip that away. And when people play the game, you know, they don't think about, uh, you know, all the money and all that kind of stuff. They play it because uh, they're good at it and they love the game. But uh, Soto's going to get a nice payday. Um, um, I don't know if I can convince the Orioles to, to jump mm-hmm. in on the bidding or not. <laughs> um, but uh, everybody uh, um, would like uh, Soto uh, uh, as a player. Sits in there in the middle of the lineup, gets on base, clutch, you yeah. know, really great all-around player. So, uh, yeah, he's going to get a, he's going to get a big payday. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's just an incredible hitter. Um, and and yeah, you know, you're now a part owner of the Orioles and yeah, I don't know how much, but you'll be able to, um, yeah, do to bring in Soto, but, um, but yeah, you're going to have to start making, I mean, the team is going to have to start making uh, decisions about where they put their money. Obviously you've got a ton of young stars there. Um, but also, you know, maybe you'll be active in free agency, which this team has not been too much in recent years. Um, how do you kind of holistically look at, you know, how you go about building a team? I mean, obviously young cheap stars are what everyone wants, but then, you know, you can only have that core for so long. So then you have to make some tough decisions. So we, we do have a special situation that uh, is attributed to Mike Elias. Mike Elias came over, um, you know, went through some pain at first, uh, you know, with losing and rebuilding and all that. But uh, he's, he's uh, put a system together that, uh, and a culture together that's, uh, when you look at it, you almost want to take your hands off and say, hey, we got a, we got a great baseball thing going on right now. Um, and from my view, it's like, how can I help you? How can I uh, um, continue? Now, you're right. Decisions are going to have to be made. Um, the good part about it is that we have a young, young nucleus and we're packed with talent in the minor leagues. And so just trying to find the pieces that can play together and stay together for a while. And then uh, certainly contract decisions are going to have to be made. And I think, you know, uh, this ownership group, you know, uh, um, is willing to look at that and is willing to, uh, uh, I think, invest in players to, um, to help push you to that World Series. Now, we won 101 games uh, two years ago. Last year, we made the uh, playoffs. We clinched. They got two home games, um, but we didn't win a game in the playoffs. And this young nucleus is uh, gaining experience and understanding that, you know, when the pressure gets really high, you know, that's when you got to kind of calm yourself and say, okay, let's just play the game the way we did during the regular season and let's let it happen as, a, as opposed to let's forcing it to happen. So I, I look forward to this nucleus of, uh, of kids. Uh, and I call them kids now. I must, <laughs> must tell me how old I am. 
But uh, you look at these guys coming up uh, in their early 20s and facing the challenges and learning the game, whatever else. It, it's fun to watch. Uh, my personal favorite is watching Gunnar Henderson. Yeah. I mean, Good big player. kid at shortstop, uh, you know, he's fast, got a great range, got all the tools or whatever else, but he's still learning. Um, great hitter at the plate, great clutch guy. Um, and so looking at the, that level of talent, there's a lot of hope and a lot of expectations for this club. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and and yeah, you know, oh, you've, you're here with Sage, and I'm wondering if, you know, it's a financial analytical tool. Is that something, the sort of thing you might use to make some of these tough decisions? Well, I mean, it, it is interesting as in the, in the age of analytics with baseball, you know, uh, I was always uh, analytical myself and you would take the data um, and then help it, help you make decisions in the business world. You need the same thing. You need uh, you need to have the information and the data and all those things to make good, timely decisions. And we did an interesting um, um, commercial shoot or a photo shoot comparing uh, with Sage, comparing how do you perform in the clutch? You know, and what are the key factors? And a lot of, uh, I think Ryan Howard was there. You know, I was there. And we were just kind of comparing notes about uh, about that. It is about uh, the strategy. It is about the information that allows you to perform in that moment. You know, a uh, long time ago, uh, when you're playing a position, they would say, okay, ask yourself, what are you going to do when the ball's hit to me? Now, that's just an elementary way you teach it in, in, uh, in Little League. But at the big league level, all that data comes in so much more, and it changes from pitch to pitch. So the appropriate data, the appropriate information to allow you, yourself to say, there is a situation, this is how I'm going to act if this happens. All that stuff is available to you. And in business, um, I found myself, um, um, a lot of the stuff you learn in baseball applies to business. But uh, the key factor is that you need information. You, need, you can't just do it by your gut. You can't do it by instinct. You need all the pertinent information. And the better information you have, the better decisions you can make and the quicker you can make those decisions. Yeah. On that clutch thing, I mean, that is maybe the biggest point of contention between like the so-called like analytical people and the whatever else people, the, you know, the uh, traditional people say, or, you know, you're growing up as a kid, it's like, oh yeah, that guy's clutch or that guy always falls apart. And you look at the analytics and say, ah, it's actually a lot more random than, <laughs> um, than, than your sort of the narratives we come up with will have you believe. Um what? I thought, I thought yeah, that was, what are your thoughts there? Lines. I thought that was really interesting is if you look at Judge, and yeah. clearly Judge was uh, um, trying a little bit too hard, kind of make it happen. Yeah. But it, all it takes is one really good swing and a ball hit, and all of a sudden you, you start to get him back again. Mm -hmm. And um, I found in my clutch situations when I had a chance, I wish I had played in the playoffs in the World Series more. I, I, I know what it feels like to win one World Series, and I had a yeah. chance to play in a number of other uh, playoff series. But I, I found myself talking to myself quite a bit, reminding myself that, uh, you know, the harder, the better you want it, the more you try, sometimes you get yourself get in your own way. So mm -hmm. pull it back a little bit, breathe a little bit uh, easier, you know, kind of let it happen. Uh, let the game come to you like you do during the regular season. But that's not that's not easy to do. It's, it's, it's learning yourself in those moments. And I think sometimes you have to experience those things first, like I was saying about the Oriole guys. They have to experience those th things first so, so they can learn about themselves and then make the adjustments in those type of games. Yeah, right. Yeah, sometimes you have to remember all the things that got you to that point in the first place and not suddenly change everything. Um, I was twenty. I was 23, just turned 23 when we were in the World Series. Yeah. And when, I, when it happened to me, I was scared to death. You know, uh, mm -hmm. first the American League Championship Series, that felt more like the, uh, the regular season. Uh, we were going to, uh, against people that we knew. The yeah. Chicago White Sox. We had a nice rivalry against them, uh, but then once you go to the uh, to the world to the World Series, um, it was it was before interleague play. So the, right. so the only time you saw them was maybe the All Star games and stuff like that. Um, it felt like a whole new experience, and it felt like it was a different game. And then yeah. it took a few minutes to realize that it's the same game. And mm -hmm. then once you once you get to that point, then you can start to perform. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think obviously the the you know cats out of the bag with interleague play we're never going back but you do lose that mystique of like these guys have never seen each other in right. the world series um you know the mlb is not gonna throw all of them interleague play away not it's not gonna throw away like having otani play in every city just for that you know one week of mystery but um but yeah you, you do lose that well i mean i i did experience this kind of interesting the all-star games when it happened they were more real games you know that mm -hmm. uh, i remember the managers uh, in their pregame speech 
saying those guys over there think that they're better than us. We're here to prove that they're not. Yeah. And so it really wasn't an exhibition game. It was uh, you're managing and playing the game to win. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, you see Pete Rose ran over Ray Foster yeah. you know, right. uh, to win the game in the All-Star game. That was the kind of feeling for a while. And then when it does cross over, um, uh, uh, and, and, and I guess it, the sport evolves, um, I thought interleague play was really a good idea on a limited basis to take advantage of the local rivalries, you know, uh, or build some local rivalries. Um, but once that kind of spreads out, your point about Otani being seen in other cities, you want your stars to travel around and be in all, you know, 30 yeah. markets. And that, that, that makes sense to me. But there was something kind of special and mysterious about playing, uh, playing in the World Series and playing in the All-Star game. Yeah, yeah, and from New York and those those first Mets versus Yankees series, those were such like ego battles. And like awesome. now I kind of don't really care. It's just, you know, it's just another game. It's it's a little nicer to beat the Yankees, I'm a Mets fan, than it is to beat other teams. But it's like and you know, I, I have to take like a little bit of pride that the Mets beat the Dodgers twice, the Yankees only beat them once. But you know, it's just these these little ego battles you have. Uh, I guess with for us down in Baltimore here, uh we got the the Phillies come down. You know, and it, and it feels like it feels more of a rivalry to me because we played yeah. them in the World Series, but they're really close in proximity. And the Nationals being right down the road, right. you know, that uh, it allows the fans to go back and forth either way. It's, it still creates a, a, a another level of excitement. Yeah. And actually on the the Nationals, I mean, the, the Orioles and Nationals had a sort of bizarre, unique media situation for, for years that I, I think is sort of slowly unwinding itself. But um, what, what it relationship do you anticipate this ownership your ownership group coming in having with the nationals who are you know your your neighbors well i think you're referring to uh you know the deal when the nationals came into the marketplace and yes. uh, the, yeah. the formation of masson you know as a way to kind of uh uh make that fairer and so masson owned the television rights for both uh, um the, the orioles and the nationals and and yeah and so it really wasn't free to negotiate what the value of, of each one of them is. So, so I think they're working on that issue and that problem. And I think, yeah. uh, you know, uh, David Rubenstein, I know, is aware of them. And, and uh, you know, uh, he's looking to um, uh, to solve that, you know, because yeah. it seems to have gone unsolved for all this time, which which is, is not good overall. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, without getting into the minutia of, of all those details, uh, it's really cool, I think. I grew up around Baltimore and and uh, the Orioles had that marketplace down in D.C. And, and even when I played with them there, we would spend time down there. But I think it's kind of cool to have a team so close. You know, it's uh, uh, the Baltimore, Washington market for the Orioles was Baltimore and Washington. And I guess it was, you know, five million or so in, in and around D.C., two million uh, in around Baltimore. So you can see that the Orioles benefited from that now. You know, when when the Nationals came in, they capture the five million and we're we're still trying to, you know, uh, expand, uh, you know, the interest of, of fans around and get them to come back to the ballpark uh, in the numbers that uh, that they came back when Camden Yards first opened up and we sold out for 10 or 12 years in a row. Yeah. And just sort of broadening out from there, how do you think the Rubenstein ownership group is going to be different from the Angelos? Uh, so I think it's really interesting. I, I've got a chance to know David better you know, recently, but I've had a chance to meet him and know him for quite a long time now. And uh, we kind of joked about it early on because there was always rumors that the Orioles were going to be sold or, you know, uh, there was rumors that went around that uh, involved me. So I told him on a couple of occasions, you know, I said, you should buy the Orioles if they come up. <laughs> and then he, he kind of looked at me like I was half nuts. Mm -hmm. But I think David's really enjoying it. And Michael Arigetti is, is uh, some of the two principal guys that, uh, that are involved. And I liked how they described their ownership as they were stewards of, the, of, of a franchise and that it's Baltimore, that Baltimore has a rich history and you want to you uh, expand on that. And so being a steward of the franchise is different than saying, I'm the owner, I can do X, Y, and Z. But, uh, they respect the, uh, uh, the, the Orioles history and the, uh, and the Orioles. And, and it is funny when you come in I think normally when the teams are for sale, the biggest problem you have is to fix the baseball piece. But uh, um, for us, you don't need to fix the baseball piece. The baseball piece is, is thriving and doing really well. Um, again, like I said earlier, you might want to keep your, your hands away from that um, and, and enjoy, you know, because really it's all about winning. It's all about selling, winning, and excitement at the ballpark. And uh, the Orioles want to get back to that, uh, that history that we had when I grew up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And are there things on the business side, you know, 
maybe with Sage or maybe just however, however you do it, um, that you see if the baseball side doesn't need any fixing, any any adjustments you see on the other side. Well, I'm sure I'm sure that uh, um, we're looking at all the business uh, um, uh, applications and all the ways that you can get people excited about coming back. And the excitement level around the ballpark this year was fantastic. And uh, and I used to think, you know, when we went through rebuilding years that you lose your fans a little bit. Um, but I think I can't remember who told me this. I think they just went into hibernation a little bit. They were always there. And then when you start to return to uh, excellence and winning and, and uh um, and being really fun to come to the ballpark, you know, it awakens, you know, the, the Oriole fan and they, they start to come out again. So we're, we're in the process of trying to awaken the Oriole fans. You can check out Cal and Ryan Howard and Kim Ng talking about clutch and w- what goes into it and Sage's social channels and some fascinating videos there. Cal from Jr., thank you so much for joining us on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. I enjoyed it myself. We all have two ages, our true age and our biological age. Our bio age suggests how healthy or unhealthy we are inside. You want your bio age years younger than your true age. Let me tell you how Field of Greens is helping me do that. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com, fieldofgreens.com. Victor Wembanyama and Chet Holmgren are seven-foot players drafted in consecutive years who play in the Western Conference. They are first and second in the Rookie of the Year voting last year. It's natural to compare the two of them. Whether or not they personally care has weirdly become a topic of debate. ESPN writer Michael C. Wright pointed out that Wembanyama won't even say Holmgren's name when asked about him directly. He just refers to the Thunder because of the seething rivalry. But there's another interpretation to Wemby's phrasing, which is that he's really not thinking specifically about Holmgren when they're playing the Thunder. Chet made that case when he was asked about it, saying, the NBA is a business. That's how they advertise those games. I just see it as a form of advertisement, referring to the hype around the matchup. The real problem with the rivalry is that only one of these teams is good. The Thunder are a trendy NBA finals pick, and the Spurs might not even make the playoffs. This might turn into a real rivalry when the Spurs get Wemby some support. Over to MLB, every member of the Dodgers can now call themselves a World Series champion after their victory on Wednesday. For some, like Shohei Otani, it's their first World Series win. Others like Walker Buehler won with the Dodgers in 2020, and some like Freddie Freeman have won with other teams. Mookie Betts now has three championships between the Dodgers and Red Sox. But none of them come close to someone who is cheering from the suites. Magic Johnson is a part owner of the Dodgers. With their victory, he now has two World Series rings. He has five NBA championships as a player and five more from his time in the ownership group of the Lakers. He has a WNBA ring as a part owner of the LA Sparks and another from MLS for LAFC. Add in the 1979 NCAA championship in the famous Bird vs. Magic final, and he has 15 championships total. The guy does seem to have a touch. With the Dodgers win ending the season, Juan Soto is now a free agent, and while he seems to have enjoyed his time as a Yankee, certainly open to coming back, he is keeping his market as open as possible. After the Yankees were eliminated, he told reporters, quote, I'm really happy with the city, with the team, but at the end of the day, we will see. I don't have any doors closed or anything like that, so we're going to be available for all 30 teams. He also added, it's going to be exciting. I think every player in the big league wants to experience this. I agree that every player in baseball would like multiple teams coming with offers north of half a billion dollars. Along with him, Corbin Burns, Pete Alonso, Willie Adamas, Max Fried, Blake Snell, and Alex Bregman could all get nine-figure deals. Which teams can actually spend, however, is always a question, especially in an offseason when a large chunk of the league doesn't have a media deal. My colleague Eric Fisher has been looking into this, and he joins us next. Joined now by Front Office Sports Newsletter writer, Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. Great to have you on. So the MLB offseason is here. We're already seeing you know, some little moves that teams clearly were, were ready to do once the, the World Series concluded. Uh, but the big fish is now in the ocean. Juan Soto <laughs> yeah. is um, yeah. <laughs> said he's you know entertaining offers from all 30 teams or is you know, willing to listen to, to any team. Um, how do you see his market shaping up? 
Uh, well, it's not going to be anywhere close to all 30, yeah. of course. There's only about really four or five clubs that are really in serious position to sign him. This is uh, somebody who's probably going to exceed $600 million. That seems to be the, the gravitational pull at this point. And depending on how it's structured, he actually might beat Otani in present-day value. So we're talking about a select handful of clubs. So Yankees, Mets, Dodgers, Phillies, maybe the Cubs, uh, but those big market teams that have controls uh, control over their own RSNs, that's going to be a differentiating factor of those that actually can economically play in that space. Yeah, and I want to get to the, the media part of this in a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really is like Yankees, Mets, Dodgers. Yeah, maybe you throw in the Phillies. There's probably going to be some weird team like the, you know, the Padres or the Blue Jays that like sort of makes some noise and doesn't actually mystery sign team. him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> With Boris, his agent, there's always a mystery team. Um, but yeah, it is, it's one of these moments where you start to see the stratification in the MLB market where for a certain class of player, Soto, Otani, you know, a handful of others, Judge, uh, what we're talking about, yeah, maximum five teams. Oh, 100%. Um, and so, yeah, so... Yeah, he's going to look around, but it, the money's going to be probably pretty similar in a lot of instances. So it really just comes down. I think it's going to be a lot of culture and fit and where he thinks he's going to be happy. Yeah, yeah, right. And because he, he can pick a spot, he will be able, he'll get, he'll get a lot of money wherever he plays. No um, doubt. So, yeah, so that'll be interesting. Uh, and yeah, just on the, the point you made about how he could beat Otani in present day value. That's because, you know, Otani's getting $2 million a year for 10 years and then $68 million per year starting in, oh, was it 2033, right? Or 34? Um, yeah, I mean, the expectation so that, is that, I mean, nobody else has deferred that much of their contract. Right. I mean, that, that is just so out there, not just in the size, but the amount of deferral. And right now there's no expectation um, that there's going to be that kind of deferral. And really, Otani is young enough um, – just turned 26 that you can do a 15 year contract and actually kind of expect him to play the actual 15 years yeah it means soto right it's right yeah, out enough. a big nut like that um yeah will have a high average annual value um but not necessarily need to defer so much right right yeah and and yeah so so Otani's value is calculated at something in like the 50 millions per year right so, somewhere in uh, there 46 46 okay yeah um so yeah and soto certainly could beat that um and it'll be interesting to see if he does any creative structuring um to the point you made about you know some teams have their own rsn or obviously especially the dodgers have their media deal locked in basically for eternity um and it's very lucrative whereas other teams um especially kind of middle tier middle markets you know are thinking guardians brewers twins reds tigers um had their contract either expired or dropped with diamond sports group. Um, and they're going to get some local media money, obviously, but it's probably not going to be what it was before. And we might see a bunch of teams, especially in the middle of the country, um, not spending what they might've, you know, these aren't the biggest spenders, but they're, they're all teams that will shell out, you know, a $20 million a year contract here and there. Um, we might not see a lot of those from those teams. Oh, absolutely. I think we're going to get to the winter meetings here pretty quickly and see a lot of the teams, GMs of those teams in the middle pack that you describe say they don't know really what they can do for 2025 yet because they don't know what that local media situation is going to be, which is such a key piece of a team's overall revenue. And so we've got uh, coming up on November 14th, the confirmation hearing scheduled for Diamond Sports Group. So we'll find out whether or not they can actually get across the finish line and reorganize this viable company again. But even if they do, who do they keep in their baseball portfolio? Because they're trying to renegotiate with a bunch of teams. Um that may or may not be successful. So there's that's sort of like a multi-part question there. And all that adds up to is exactly that kind of revenue uncertainty that you described. Right. And so like we were saying, this is probably what Juan Soto is going to be fine. Corbin Burns is, is going to make his hundreds of millions. Um, do you see this affecting other parts of the free agent market though? 
Oh yeah, the your middle and lower tier. Um, it's those guys are going to be waiting around a long time, or you know, potentially at least longer, uh, wanting to know where they're going to have a job for next year. And so then there was a corollary effect. Do some of these guys, uh, get hurt because they're not exactly working with a team yet? They can work out on their own, but they're not in the off season conditioning program with their new team. Um, what does that mean going into spring training? There's a lot of domino effects there. Right. And we saw, I mean, I think they, they ended up being called the Boris four. There's like this group of players, all the Scott Boris who uh, only started, uh, they only signed, you know, it was something in like late March or I, I don't remember all the time right, exactly, but training. right. is right. Yeah. And like one of them was Jordan Montgomery, who uh, looks like a savvy deal at the time, but didn't work out. And, you know, you wonder if not having a normal off season and not having a team for spring training, uh, you know, routines are with really, him really big for players in this sport. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, another um, player who's, not a free agent, and I don't think would be, but could come to Major League Baseball is Roki Sasaki. This is a name some of us have been hearing for years now. Um, yeah, what's so he's he's got, I guess it's not really his choice, but he may get posted, right? What's the story here? Yeah, so we're waiting to see whether he does get posted. Certainly, there's been mutual interest uh, between the player himself and major league baseball to try to make that happen, whether or not it does, he's still only 22, uh, but just a ton of talent. And what we saw from Yamamoto in particularly in game two of the world series, you know, is a little bit of an up and down season for him. Uh, you know, there's a lot of hype coming in from Otani and, you know, there were some bumps along the way, but that world series performance, you know, really was a big uh, exclamation point on the season. It was, you know, obviously instrumental in, in helping pave the way for the Dodgers to ultimately win. Um, so I think that just gives another uh, boost of confidence in these teams, at least the ones that could afford them, looking at the uh, looking at a Japanese pitcher, and particularly one that's still young like this and doesn't have essentially the, the wear and tear as maybe an older one does. Right. And my understanding is that currently <clears throat> he's in the situation that if he did come over, he'd be in the situation that Otani was in where he still has to just like be under team control, whichever team he he goes with, he can't just sign as a free agent. Um, he has to, I think, essentially go through the the arbitration system, you know, be under team control for six years. Whereas if he waited like Yamamoto, he, he could be a free agent and, you know, I think get, I believe that was the biggest free agent pitcher contract in history, yep. you know, 300 something million from the Dodgers. So he seems to maybe want to come over anyway. Otani obviously did. Um, it's it also it's up to his team in Japan if they honor his request. But um, you know, as much as we'd like to see him, it'd be you know really fun to have another you know Japanese phenom over here. Um, it might make sense for everyone involved to to wait a little bit. Yeah, it, it's a delicate thing because there are the financial uh, considerations that you describe. You know, there's home, it's his home country, but by the same token, you know, these are all competitive, highly driven athletes and Major League Baseball is the preeminent league in the world in this sport. Uh, that's just, you know, the highest and best competition. Obviously, it's mostly American, but, you know, comes from a number of other countries as well. This is the if you want to compete at the highest level, this is the place to do that. And that's always going to be a powerful lure. Yeah. And he might've just watched Yamamoto and Otani win a world series and say, Oh, there you I, go. I'd like to do that too. Yeah. Um, and before we let you go, any updates on um, the Oakland A's or the Tampa Bay Rays, both of whom will be playing in minor league stadiums. Uh, well, for the A's for three plus years, the Rays were still TBD, I guess couple of small things we we've talked about both teams extensively but we've just gotten some updated game times on the uh 2025 schedule for the a's in sacramento and as we expected there is a heavy heavy concentration of night games particularly in the middle of the season to try to mitigate against the uh extreme heat there in the california capital so that's very much as expected that somewhere around 60 of the 81 games are going to be night contests to try to deal with that on the Rays, we talked about the hurricane situation and the unfortunate damage from Hurricane Milton on the TROP. Uh, the hope from the league side at this point, while that damage assessment is still being done, the hope is that they'll have some clarity on what the team is going to be doing for 2025 by Christmas. So these next 
six to eight weeks are going to be uh, pretty uh, important as the league and the Rays and the local officials kind of sort through the damage assessment and then figure out what the next steps might look like. Yeah, be very interesting offseason there. Eric Fisher, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Sure, always a pleasure. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. Patrick Mahomes wants a WNBA team in Kansas City, and it sounds like he's up for being part of the effort to make that happen. The superstar quarterback called the idea a no-brainer, given the growth of the WNBA and the support for college basketball at Kansas University. He and his wife, Brittany, are part owners of the NWSL's KC Current. He noted that he has met many women athletes who, quote, didn't get some of the same things that I got coming up as far as the resources and the facilities and stuff like that. So I want to give them those same resources, those same facilities. I want to continue to work in women's sports as long as I can. That's it for today. Leave us a rating and review wherever you like to tune in and tell a friend about the show. If you're on YouTube, throw us a like and subscribe and watch out for our weekend edition. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.